They say the people refuse, then there is no space, there is no bed. So they come back in the community, it's dangerous for us. And that's how it spreads further because now yes. they're back. We are prepared to sacrifice and to do the service mm -hmm. for the Liberian people. 20 cases yesterday, 40 cases today, and you know that tomorrow it's going to be 70. These are real people with real stories and, and real lives. The Ebola is a deadly disease. You must understand it. Ebola, an infectious disease that spreads through contact with bodily fluids, including saliva and sweat, has an extremely high fatality rate and is currently wreaking havoc in West Africa. The recent outbreak, which is the largest of all time, really took hold in March of 2014 in Guinea. It quickly spread to Liberia and Sierra Leone, with cases also found in Senegal, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Nigeria. As we gather here today, the people of Liberia are in crisis. The Ebola virus is spreading at alarming speed. This epidemic could kill hundreds of thousands of people in the coming months. Right as U.S. President Barack Obama announced that he would be sending American troops to help combat the epidemic, Vice News headed to Monrovia, the capital of Liberia, to document the fight against the disease. With around 3,000 confirmed cases of infection, and nearly half of those cases having become fatal, Liberia is now the center point of the epidemic. What we're picking up here right now is the first line defense against Ebola, which is chlorine. So besides washing your hands, this right here, this is key. And you'll see people walking around with, uh, with spray buckets, with just like little, little satchels or little, uh, little canisters on their belt. We first headed to Redemption Hospital, which has become ground zero for Ebola cases in the city. Many potential cases are sent there first, and the hospital is overflowing and lacking the proper infrastructure to treat them. How to manage, how to be able to continue this, where you find deaths all over. It is beyond our capability, beyond our understanding. This is the reason why everyone is confused. As soon as we arrived, we saw desperate people outside trying to get treatment. I'm sorry, sir. Are you okay? He went in a latrine several times. So he has, he has the virus? Yes. So why can't we get him inside right now? I'm going to see if I can find a way. Okay. Get me, get me in there. Is there space? Are there beds inside there? Everywhere is occupied. Everywhere is occupied? Yeah, occupied. Okay. Yes. Gentleman we were just talking to outside who's been waiting out there for two hours. Um, he's clearly very sick. He clearly has the virus. But there's just, there's just no space and there's really no one there that's, that's taking care of him. Everything is completely overwhelmed. So we tried to, to bring him to the attention of the people here. I'm sure they know already, but, um, you know, the man's got to sit out there. There's nothing anyone can do right now. There's just a complete shortage of medical professionals, of healthcare facilities, of space to treat this disease. I'm the chief driver for the district taking ambulance service. I just brought eight patients on board with the ambulance. As you can see, in the, the, the patient's still on board and we are waiting for the nurses. Then I can back over here and then dispatch the patient from the ambulance. And why are they waiting? Is there just is there's no room in the uh, in the holding center right now? Yeah, uh, they're trying to create space. Are you are you scared? I mean, day to day, you're around really sick people. For me, I'm not afraid. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I'm working for my country. I'm working for my people to save life at least, so other people life can be saved. We are there working on a daily basis to take the sick people from the various community so other people can get infected. I can tell you sometimes the sorrow can be in me. Yeah. Whenever I'm seeing my citizen dying on a daily basis, people are getting sick. They're dying, my brother, I must have here. We then heard a commotion around the side of the hospital. A female patient, scared and wanting to see her family, had fled out a side exit. Hospital staff tried to get her to go back inside as a crowd formed. There's a crowd of people right by the exit of the hospital where patients are coming out. Um, clearly not the right way to contain this disease. Our people are sick, people die every day. Some in the crowd told us that they were family members of sick patients, upset about not being able to see and get updates on their loved ones. Back out front, Paul Goy was trying to get sick family members admitted inside. Five days since Sunday. Yeah. My, my daughter 
daughter, my granddaughter, and some family members had vomiting, toileting. So they're sick. They have been sick. Yeah. So I sent for the ambulance. Yeah. At that time, the ambulance was coming, it coming, it coming, it came, come. So today, the ambulance is, the ambulance came here. But then we didn't come here with them. They stay in the car. They haven't removed them. They haven't carried anything. They don't. They don't tell us anything. So it's like it's like we're sacrificing them. Part of the problem with stopping the spread of Ebola is the lack of treatment facilities and trained healthcare staff. At JFK Hospital, the situation wasn't much better. We then headed to a clinic run by Doctors Without Borders, also known as Médecins Sans Frontières, or MSF. That morning, MSF had stopped admitting new patients because of a planned expansion, and because one of their expat healthcare workers had tested positive for Ebola. MSF had been on the front lines fighting Ebola since the beginning of the outbreak, and had been pleading with the international community for more attention for some time. They too, however, are forced to turn away patients. Paul, who we had met earlier at Redemption Hospital, was now at MSF trying to get treatment. Across the street, we met Victor Marcos, who was trying to get his older brother admitted to a treatment center, with no luck. Have you tried to go to the hospital? They say no. Call the ambulance, call the ambulance. Nothing, nothing. We even go to GFK, they tell us that we won't go ahead and bring the person to the, the center and we brought him here. They said, no way, we can't enter unless we go look for Amole around. So JFK says go to MSF. Yes. MSF says they so can't take you. No, take, they can't take off. What can you do now? What can you do? I, nothing that I don't know, I, nothing that I can do because I don't have any hospital to take me. I don't have Amole to go for A and bring here. I like, only when you go. So I don't know what to do. I'm confused. While we were talking to Victor, a woman who lived nearby approached and told us that some sick people in her community had been turned away from the clinic. They had just returned home, and she feared they might spread the virus. They said that people refuse them. There is no space, there is no bed. So they come back in the community, it's dangerous for us. And that's how it spreads further, because now yes. they're back, yeah. They are very sick. They were vomiting, toileting on the stuff. They're going to the house. Where are they right now? They're behind them, they're living on the other side. And you call ambulances, you call police, no one does anything? Nobody. Nobody. Yeah, the yeah, people even went there at the gate and they refused yeah, please him. Please help the people, sure. man. People are dying. Is it okay for us to talk to them? They'll be okay yeah, with us. Yeah. 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 What do you think? What do you think it's okay to go? What's your, what's your... Don't go inside the house. What's your vibe? Yeah, that's it. I don't like your, your face, right? I don't know what to do. After a short debate, we decided not to follow up on the potentially infected neighbors for fear of our own safety and because we didn't want to give the impression that we could provide help. So we're headed to West Point right now, which is the largest slum in Monrovia. Ebola hasn't hit there uh, harder than it's hit anywhere else, but the government tried to quarantine it about a month ago. Uh, and riots broke out, a treatment center was looted, uh, and the army actually opened fire and, and killed a child. So there's a lot of distrust of the government there. Liberia is still recovering from two brutal civil wars fought from 1989 to 2003. Additionally, many Liberians also see their government as woefully corrupt, with even President Ellen Sirleaf Johnson admitting corruption was endemic. Both of these reasons contribute to the lack of trust in the government and help explain why relations between the community of West Point and authorities are so strained. We're on our way to reach Katie Myler, who runs a tuition-free school for vulnerable girls in West Point. In recent weeks, her organization More Than Me has shifted to dealing with stopping the spread of Ebola in West Point. This includes creating awareness teams who go out and spread information on the virus. I mean, is it getting better here? Is it getting worse? Is the awareness helping? Well, what's getting better is that as the, uh, the disease or the virus is actually spreading and getting worse, the, the thing is that people have changed their minds. It's been a lot of chaos here, and that is because there hasn't been a lot of communication. The awareness team really just started recently, like within the last week. So, I mean, you had weeks where people were not really getting information, and every single day you, know, you have 20 cases yesterday, 40 cases today, and you know that tomorrow it's going to be 70. So. Uh, you know, every day it's like more and more people. And I know these sound like numbers, but when it's like my neighbor, for example, this morning I went to his house and he was sick, I was able to give him drugs. 
but he he died this afternoon. It's like these are real people with real stories and and real lives. We are doing active case planning. That is, we are trying to locate all of the sick people. Archie is spearheading the effort in West Point and has been leading teams around the community. People have been taken off to holding centers. From holding centers, after screening, they are taken to uh, the, the, the ETU, the emergency or, or, or treatment unit. But for now, all of the ETUs, uh, uh, the ETU is failed. All of the holding centers are failed. So what we are doing is to try to ensure that we engage them at home. We engage the sick people at home. Archie's team focuses on contact tracing which locates sick people and tries to find out who came in contact with them and may also have been infected, so they can be monitored as well. So what can you do for her? Trying to ensure that while she's here, she can be getting some medicine to be taken. Mm -hmm. She can be getting some food to keep her screen. Then as soon as we get available space back there, we can use the ambulance to take her out quickly. And who's taking care of her? I mean, her daughter is young. She's here. Does she know how to, how to take care of her? Does she know not to touch her and not I to touch her? just got to know about it today. Okay. I just got to know about it today. Yeah. So the next thing we're going to do now is to talk to one person mm -hmm. how to take care of her and how they are going to go or in, you know, in taking care of her. Okay. What are all those steps, preventive steps they need to take to not uh, have yourself in problem too. Okay. We're going to do that today. So you're going to educate the family here yeah, sure. about how to take care of her. How, how to take care of her. We are going to have uh, the nurses coming in to close and look at her. They will also be out there trying to ensure that we find space quickly that the ambulance can take her to the hospital. Ebola has an incubation period of anywhere from 2 to 21 days after coming in contact with it, meaning that it sometimes doesn't become apparent someone has it until three weeks later. Unfortunately, in a poor neighborhood like West Point, there's also lots of other diseases, like cholera and malaria, that show similar symptoms to Ebola, adding to the challenge of contact tracing. Look at the place we live. For instance, if Ebola is West Point, it's telling that all of all are infected. Are all yeah, yeah, there's different. Look at, place where okay. we live. Look at this world, it's very stained. Yeah. yeah. Look at this dumb bro. So you're saying there's a lot of disease here anyway? Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of disease. Some, there's a lot of disease here. We have chloride disease here. So many diseases in this community. So people are dying by different, different diseases, but not Ebola. So you believe Ebola exists, you just don't think it's in West Point? Yes. I believe Ebola is real, but not in West Point. But not in West Point, okay. But don't you think that if you don't take the precautions, maybe Ebola will come here? Yeah, that, that, is, that, that is true. We're heading to meet Sam, the data manager for More Than Me, and another one of the staff leaders working in West Point. He recently returned to Liberia from decades of living abroad in America. I left here when I was about eight years old. I'd say about January, February. And I left and came here. With everything happening right now, why are you sticking around? Why are you in, in West Point, you know, trying to give your time and help out? You know, because our, our people need help, our people need hope, you know, and, and I think the people need individuals that they can trust, right? And I think part of the problem here um, with a lot of people not believing Ebola is real and this is a scam for the government to take money is because they don't trust the government. You know, and I mean, I, 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 they have a lot of reasons not to trust the government. Ebola is a deadly disease. You must understand it. We were just uh, with the awareness teams sort of going door to door checking on sick people and we got a call. Um, a prisoner, a man who was arrested, was in court, started throwing up and they think he's sick and the whole courthouse cleared out. So they're trying to figure out what to do with him right now, but it's sort of, you know, this is what it is here. It's, it's chaos and people don't really know how to respond all the time and, and what to do, how to, how to cope with this. The ambulance finally showed up. No small feat considering there's also an ambulance shortage in Monrovia. Displays like this, however, sometimes further strain community relations and lead to stigma for Ebola victims. Despite the chaotic scenes in West Point and outside treatment centers, in most of Monrovia, life moved along as normal as it could. It wasn't a zombie land. People all still went about their daily lives with some added precautions put in place. The city was undergoing a heavy duty awareness campaign. And most Liberian rappers had even recorded songs warning people to be careful. Ebola is at its most infectious on dead bodies of its victims, which makes burials and funerals an extremely risky practice. Monrovia's dead were no longer being buried. Instead, they were being cremated so as not to infect others. We met up with a body retrieval team working with the International Federation of Red Cross. Their job was to collect bodies from all over the city and prep them for cremation. Their first stop was JFK Hospital. A healthcare worker had passed away, 
and the family had received special permission to bury the body. We do come to JFK to pick patients the dead bodies up, but we take them for crematoriums, not for burial. So what we see today is an exception. This particular deceased is a health worker that contracted Ebola, and the, the family wanted a burial. Is that a big concern for you with these guys going in there? I mean, do you worry about them getting sick? Do you worry about them contracting disease? Every day. Yeah. It's on my mind that it's a possibility that they could get exposed to the disease. And I'm sure it plays in the mind of my team. Unfortunately, there was a mix-up at JFK. We've been dressed for almost an hour plus now. Yeah. And we couldn't identify the body. The body that we came to pick up, it's like they're saying that they've already taken the body. And the family members say the body is here. And the doctor said he has, you know, placed it somewhere else so that we, when, when we comes in, we'll be able to identify the body. But we'll guard you now. The whole thing was messed up. Nobody knows who took the body from jail. Things got a bit confusing inside JFK. Amid the confusion, a sick man straggled up outside the hospital gates. His family said he had tested positive for malaria and typhoid, but precautions were still necessary. Ebola has stressed the Liberian healthcare system so much that even those with other diseases are being turned away. Each time we pick up body, each time anything we do, we spray, we spray our body. Anything we touch, we spray until you can be <laughs> But even with that, I mean, there's gotta be, it's, it's a really scary disease. No, it's I mean, a scary disease, but we've trained. We, if we don't do it, who, 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 who would do it? Yeah. Who would do it? And nobody would do it, so we are trained for this purpose. So we don't want that scenario to say that oh, there are a lot of dead bodies in the streets of Morovia and, and nobody's picking it up. So once we are trained and we have the capability, we have to do it in our own quarter to serve the nation. So you can see like the, uh, the bleach on the back of your shirt right now, right? Yo, oh, just from yeah, nice. All your shirts now just covered, covered in bleach? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Emmanuel joked about it, but he's doing one of the most dangerous jobs in the city. Every precaution needs to be taken and even taking off the personal protection equipment suits needs to be handled meticulously. Otherwise, the suit wearer can get infected. This is what they do 10 times a day. They have nine stops today. They suit up, they get ready, and they go. And, you know, they can't make one little mistake, because if they do, it's going to spread. One of their team members is going to get sick. It's going to be even harder to get people to do this job. No gloves for you. Yeah, no, no, I'm okay, because I'm going to go out. So what we've, uh, what we've been told is that the symptoms here lead them to believe it's probably not Ebola, it might be rabies or something of that nature. But because of the situation, every precaution has to be taken. So everybody that's being disposed of now is being treated as if it's an Ebola victim. The body retrieval teams often face reluctance from family members, especially when the symptoms are in line with other diseases. No one wants to see a loved one carried off in a body bag. Outside an abandoned mansion on the outskirts of Monrovia, family members of an Ebola victim told us how they think he caught the disease. He went at the mosque, he cleaned up, and the last time we heard that he had barely had the mosque, Ebola. Oh, at the mosque. For three days, from that time, we've been avoiding him, we've been watching on him. After he came Monday, we saw his eyes were red, red. We told him to go to his house and wait. Because they're doing the burials at the mosque, yeah. and you think he caught it from one of the bodies that was yeah, there. So, yeah, like, you know that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Start calling, 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 but the people delay. And they so place if you can uh, actually uh, appeal to yeah. these people up there to respond to call very fast, it will be fine. Uh, so his community told him to come here. They kicked yeah, him out. They drove yeah, they him away. You. They drove him over here to put him in this house to keep him away from yeah, everyone. Very self, we are his family. Yeah. We came after we saw him. Yeah, we told him to come around his side. Huh? What we have for him, the food and thing. We went behind, we cleaned the place. We told him to be there until we can call the people to, to come, come here. Yes. And he started calling on Sunday when he got really sick. Yes. When did he pass away? Huh? When Last did he pass night. away? Last night. Yeah. So you have to do this 10 times a day. You talk to people who've lost their relatives. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that affect your mind? Are you... No, it doesn't affect no, our mind. No? no? We've been trained for this. Yeah. And we are prepared to sacrifice and to do the service mm -hmm. for the Liberian people.
So we're headed into a Redemption Hospital right now, which is sort of in the belly of the beast here with the outbreak. Um, it was supposed to be a holding center, but it turned into a treatment center because patients had, had nowhere to go. We headed in to meet the medical director, Dr. Mohamed Sango, who had been overseeing all efforts against Ebola. So, so did you build this all? We built it. We built this when the, when the outbreak started? We just did a few days when, oh, they, when, when they decided that they would have a holding place there. Oh, because you weren't a holding center until the recently. Holding center. We found out that this holding center is, instead of going in hours, it's going in days. Patients are there languishing without taking them, you know, to the, to the right, rightful place. And was your staff, I mean, were they trained to handle this stuff before the outbreak started? No. no. Yeah. For this particular outbreak, of course, they were trained to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the practical aspects, you know, not the theoretical aspects. You see, the theoretical training and the practical training, they are different. It's one know? thing in the classroom, one, one thing in the fields. One thing in the classroom, one thing in the... In, yeah. <laughs> inside there. Yeah. What are you going to do inside there? Redemption Hospital, which is typically a free clinic, was only supposed to be a holding center for Ebola patients before they headed elsewhere for treatment. When patients started flooding in, however, it became a de facto treatment center trying to cope with the influx as best it could. The healthcare workers that you have that are treating these patients, psychologically, what they've seen the past few months, uh, it's gotta be very, very hard on them. So we have had series of death of our health workers. Lots of them have died. You can see the difference between between a, a, a developing country and a developed country like America. If you have Ebola in America and all the rest of it, all of those cases that went to America, none of them died. Do you know why? It is not because the virus per se. It is because of the way they handle the management of the disease. The medical infrastructure there is... Sure. Yeah. Number one, able to calculate to the least how much of fluid lost by this patient? Able to calculate to the least how much of electrolyte and what kind of electrolyte that is lost and then replaced. And you don't have that capability here. The capability is little or none at all. I've never seen such a thing. The case is all over. In a rampant way, it's difficult. So difficult to contain this. We need helpers. We need those who, who, have, who have experienced such pandemic before to come to our aid. How are you coping emotionally? Uh, uh, How are emotionally, you coping? I, I have to cope. I have to cope with the stress. I have to cope with the emotion. Or not, if not so, I will be a victim of circumstances. I always tell them, if you think so much about the disease and become frightened, what you're supposed to do to protect you, you cannot make it. You will not think. You will not think wisely. If the disease, the disease, the disease, the disease, the fear of that, when the fear consumes you, then the disease equally consumes you. So you have to be alert. You have to be alert at all times. No sleeping on the disease. No sleeping on your emotions. Would it be possible to follow you around on camera Definitely. and just get your rounds? But Definitely. should we get cutaways? Well, just... there are certain areas that you can go. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have PPE suits if you need us to put those on. You want to go into the EPI, you want to go into the, into the treatment center. Would that be possible? Well, if you want to, but if I were your brother. Because when you go there, listen carefully. Yeah. When you go there first and foremost, you become, you become infected and you become infectious until you take those things off. And in taking those things off, let me, let me, let me, let me advise you. If you make a mistake in taking those things off, these, those infected materials, that's how you get that. So my dear, let me tell you, just see what you can see. Go back home and meet your family again. We heeded the doctor's advice and decided not to enter the treatment center. Instead, we headed back to MSF who had recently started taking in patients again. So we're at the MSF clinic right now. They have about 160 beds here, and that's not enough at all. You know, they're, they're doing the best they can, but people keep coming in and out. Last week, there were 100 survivors they were able to transfer out. But the worry right now is that this, this thing is increasing exponentially, and it's going to keep growing and growing and growing. How hard is it for you guys to turn people away at the gate that you know are sick and need help? 
That's the worst things that we have to do uh, on a daily basis. Also with this specific uh, disease, we, uh, we have the risk of the spreading uh, when they go home. That's why we give the, the kit. It's one of the worst things. And, and what is also very difficult is that we don't know when it's going to stop. Because as long as there is not enough beds capacity in the, in the city, we will have to continue to do it. Behind me right here is the MSF gate where people line up to get in. So every morning, you know, they come out here around 8, 8.30, and judging by the people who have died last night and the people that have been released because, you know, they, they've stopped showing symptoms, that's how many people they can let in. And the people at the gate have to do a sort of triage where they see the sickest people. They let them in, they follow down this road right here, and you can see the seats down there where they, they, they await sort of the next step in the treatment that they're gonna get. How does it feel being a Liberian person and watching your country go through this, seeing your fellow citizens in here in these camps and, and there not being enough help for them right now? Well, um, to say the least, this is an emotional period for me and every Liberian. And so every day to see our brothers and sisters turn up at hospitals and they cannot be taken in simply because um, these facilities do not have the space, it's really emotional, it's heartbreaking. It's been almost two months since I last stopped going to see my mother and my daughter who's making time of her. Because I just feel that um, these are desperate times, these are dangerous times. James is waiting for his test results to come back today. Uh, and then they'll, Dominic and him will find out if they get to go home. Sophie told us about Dominic, who had tested positive for Ebola and recovered. When his three-year-old nephew James was diagnosed as well, Dominic decided to come back to the clinic and help him recover. There is strong scientific evidence that once someone survives Ebola, they are immune to the strain with which they were infected. And you made the choice to come back in and take care of him. You weren't scared. Well, when I was sick, yeah. there were other people around. I took the risks. To help? Like came to me, talked to me, advised me, encouraged me. So I think that I got a strength. I can do about other people as well. Later that night, young James' test results came back negative. He had been cured of Ebola, and him and Dominic were able to leave the clinic. James is that clinic's youngest ever Ebola survivor. And it's just day after day after day of more people coming and coming and coming. Yeah. The difficulty for our staff as well is that people are working incredibly hard. We're trying to scale up as fast as we can, but uh, you know, we know that, that by ourselves, we'll never be enough to actually get this outbreak under control. So, yeah, people are making that horrendous choice of turning people away who need healthcare every day. And then, uh, yeah, they're seeing people die and, you know, does it, numbers too. Does it feel sometimes like you're fighting a losing battle of sorts? I think that uh, there's part of that makes it very difficult for people, that they'll be doing as much as they can and working incredibly hard and it won't be enough to get it under control. So as we've seen here at MSF and among the local Liberians that we've hung out with that are, are combating this thing, Everyone's really doing all they can. You know, no one really has the capabilities. The infrastructure isn't in place. And no one really expected it to get this bad and to, for the epidemic to grow so quickly. There's hope that with the influx of US troops helping with the building of additional treatment centers and the international community finally paying attention, the spread of Ebola in Liberia can be slowed. Some, however, feel the international community has responded too late. And it will now take a much bigger effort to get the outbreak under control.